Hi, uh, in this video, we are going to start uh, chapter 9 of Edwards and Penny, uh, differential equations um, and boundary value problems. And uh, chapter 9 starts by introducing Fourier series and then um, it uses Fourier series to uh, revisit forest oscillators and also to talk about some of the basic uh, partial differential equations, namely uh, the, the heat equation, the wave equation, and the Laplace equation in um, one uh, or two space variables as well as time. And we'll get through some of these sections in our course. So we'll talk about the wave equation and the heat equation using Fourier series. Okay, so uh, for a warm-up exercise, I want you to think back to your linear algebra course when you talked about uh, orthogonality and orthogonal projection onto subspaces of Rn. And to see if uh, you remember that stuff well, here is the warm-up exercise. So consider um, the subspace of R4, which is spanned by the standard basis vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, and uh, 0, 0, 1, 0. Uh, and I've given you an odd basis for that subspace consisting of uh, twice the first standard basis vector the second standard basis vector, and three times the third uh, basis vector, just so that you can remember uh, how formulas for projection went in linear algebra. And I want you to work out the projection of the vector v, which is 1 minus 5, 2 minus 2, onto the span of the first three basis vectors, but using um, these multiples that I gave you instead, and clearly uh, when you project down to that subspace, you're going to get 1 minus 5, 2, 0. Okay, so here's how that went in linear algebra. Um, our basis, v1, v2, v3, equal to 2e1, e2, e3, 3e3, uh, um, if uh, our uh, basis is orthogonal, so mutually perpendicular, then the formula for the projection of a vector v onto w was you took of v dot v1 multiplied by the scalar 1 over magnitude v1 squared, which was uh, v1 dot v1, multiply that by v1 plus v dot v2 over magnitude v2 squared times v2 plus v dot v3 over magnitude v3 squared times v3. Okay, so uh, v1 was uh, 2e1 uh, v2 was e2 and v3 was 3e3. So when I do v dot v1, I'll just get a 2 times 1 from the first entry and then plus 0, plus 0, plus 0. So v 2e1 dot v is 2. The magnitude of v1 uh, squared is 4, 2 squared, v1 
is 2, 0, 0, plus uh, v2 is e2, v uh, dot uh, 0, 1, 0, 0 is minus 5. v2 is already a unit vector. v dot v3 is 3 times the third entry of v, which is 6. Magnitude of v3 squared is 3 squared is 9. And v3 is 0, 0, 3, 0. And let's see what we get. So the only thing contributing to the first entry is the first guy, and we get 1 half of 2, which is 1. The only thing contributing to the second entry is the second guy. We get minus 5. And in the third entry from the third guy, we get uh, 18 over 9, which is 2. Ta-da! <laughs> Go away. Okay, so that's what we were supposed to get. Hopefully that reminds you of how we did projection in linear algebra because we're going to do it just the same for Fourier series. So this second page uh, is an overview of what you did in linear algebra. And then I'll explain what it has to do um, with Fourier series for functions. So the dot product for a real vector space Rn, um, x dot y, was just defined as the sum of the squares of the products in each entry. So x1, y1 plus x2, y2 up to xn, yn. Okay, it's clear from the definition of dot product that it commutes, x dot y is y dot x. It's also clear from the definition of the dot product uh, that x dot y plus z is x dot y plus x dot z, and that x dot cy is c dot xy. The concise way of saying that is that the, the dot product is linear in each argument. Uh, since x dot x is the sum of uh, x1 squared plus x2 squared up to xn squared, it's also clear that x dot x is non-negative and can only equal 0 when x is the 0 vector. Okay, uh, all of Euclidean geometry is based on that algebra. So, um, one way to write the magnitude of a vector is as the square root of x dot x, or uh, in other words, um, the magnitude squared of x is x dot x. And using magnitude is how one way, well, is how we define Euclidean distance. The distance from points with position vectors x and y is the magnitude of the vector x minus y. And we also use the dot product to define orthogonality in Rn. So we said that x was perpendicular to z if and only if <clears throat> x dot z was 0. And uh, the reason for that is that if you look at this green triangle um, where the legs are x and z, and the hypotenuse is x or the, the third side is x plus z. And um, if you use the uh, properties a, b, c for expanding magnitude of x plus z squared, which is x plus z dot x plus z, um, you get an x dot x, which is magnitude x squared. You'll get a z dot x plus an x dot z, which is twice x dot z, and you get a z dot z, which is magnitude z squared. 
so you can see that you'll have the Pythagorean theorem exactly when uh, x dot z equals zero, that magnitude uh, x plus z squared is magnitude x squared plus magnitude z squared. Okay, so um, once you have orthogonality, uh, you can talk about orthogonal and orthonormal bases. Orthonormal bases are orthogonal, but you've uh, normalized all the vectors to have unit length. And <coughs> um, you can then define projection onto a subspace. So if you have a subspace um, W spanned by an orthogonal set of vectors, then uh, you have this projection vector for how to project a vector x in a larger space onto w. That's what we just used in the warm-up exercise. And the reason that this is the right projection formula, if you look at the, the diagram on the left here, is that if you take, if you, if you use that to define the projection and then take the vector z, which is x minus that, you can check that uh, that vector z is perpendicular to every one of your basis vectors v1 up to vk, and um, therefore it's perpendicular to anything in the subspace because anything in the subspace is a, a linear combination of those orthogonal basis vectors. And that means that you have uh, a Pythagorean theorem where the base point is that projection point for anything in the subspace. So that means that everything else in the subspace by the Pythagorean theorem is farther away uh, from x than that projection vector. All right, and then to complete the picture, we used, we actually used this projection formula inductively so that given any subspace, we could find an orthogonal basis for it using the Gram-Schmidt algorithm. Okay, so that's what you talked about in part of linear algebra. And now we're gonna generalize that to inner product spaces. So an inner product space is a real scale, a real vector space together with a generalization of the dot product, which we call an inner product. Uh, to compute an inner product, you need two elements from your vector space. And the axioms for an inner product in parallel with the left-hand side of the page are that it always has to be true that the inner product of f with g is the inner product of g with f, symmetry. The inner product has to be linear in each factor. And um, the inner product has to be non-negative. F with it, uh, So f um, inner product with f always has to be greater than or equal to 0. And the only time it's allowed to equal 0 is if you're dealing with the zero vector. And I, I wrote these vectors as using function letters f and g because that's what we're going to um, be doing for Fourier series. All right, so um, from these algebra axioms, you can just repeat the same flowchart as we had on the left. So you can talk in an inner product space, you can talk about magnitude, orthogonality, uh, and projection. And so actually, everything, you can do, do the whole development Okay, so that's the overview. Now, let's 
let's talk about Fourier series. Okay, so our inner product space is, uh, we'll have an interval A, B, and we're going to consider the set of piecewise continuous functions on that interval. Um, I'll denote them as PW, capital C of AB. Remember, C of AB is the continuous functions on the closed interval AB. Our inner product is going to be the inner product of F with G is just the integral from A to B of G of T times F of T. And um, as soon as we check the three axioms for inner products, then we can go ahead and do everything we used to do with the dot product in Rn. So if you look at these first two, the inner product of f with g is just the integral from a to b of f of t times g of t, and that's the same as the integral of g of t times f of t. And so that's why a is true. And uh, the inner product of f with g plus h is just the integral of f of t g of t plus the integral or plus uh, f of t h of t. And by integral additivity, that's the inner product of f with g plus the inner product of f with h. And similarly, you can multiply one of the functions by a constant and you will multiply the integral. by the same constant. So A and B are easy. There's a little subtlety in C, so let's uh, talk about that uh, just a, a little bit. So for C, the inner product of F with F is the integral from A to B of F of T squared dT. So, does, uh, so that's certainly greater than or equal to zero. But let's think about um, the second part. So is it true that if the integral of f squared is zero, then f is zero? Well, um, if f was continuous, and uh, some f of t naught was uh, bigger than the number delta, then there would be an interval containing t naught. Contain, I didn't spell that right, but who cares. Containing t naught such that uh, f of t was bigger than, say, delta over 2 on that interval. And then uh, that would imply that the uh, integral of f of t squared was at least delta over 2 times the length of that subinterval, so it would be strictly positive. So that shows, so if f is continuous and the integral of f squared equals zero, then by contradiction, by the argument above, um, f actually has to be identically zero. But you'll see why we want to consider piecewise continuous functions instead of just continuous. So um, what you have to do if you're going to be precise is for f, which is piecewise continuous, you have to, uh, when you say f is the zero function, you have to ignore a finite number of points. Uh, you can ignore, technically you're using an equivalence relation to identify various functions. You can ignore the values of f uh, 
at a finite number of points. Because that won't change an integral. And, and so, um, we can say, well, so that doesn't change. the value of integral of f. So technically, if the integral of f squared is 0 and uh, f is piecewise continuous, then you could have accidentally <laughs> misdefined f to be not zero at a finite number of points. So as I say, um, your elements are really elements of equivalence classes, where two functions are equivalent if they um, agree except for at a finite number of points. All right, so now this inner product here um, you may or may not have actually studied it in your linear algebra class. It's not so different from the dot product because if you think of a Riemann sum for the integral from a to b of f of t times g of t, you could, uh, say, equipartition your interval a, b, pick, say, I don't know, right-hand endpoints, uh, uh, t1 up to tn, and then a Riemann sum, uh, looking at this, and, and looking at this picture, would just be the sum of f of tj, g of tj times the width delta t, and you can write that uh, sum as a dot product of a vector containing the f values at the partition points with a vector containing the g values at the partition points, and then multiplying by the delta t, which is uh, b minus a over n. So this integral dot product is a limit of rescaled Euclidean dot products as the number of partition points uh, n goes to infinity. Okay, so let me just give you the definition of Fourier series, and we'll initially start with uh, the interval minus pi to pi and a piecewise continuous function f. And, of course, you can extend any such function to be piecewise continuous um, with, with uh, one of its periods being 2 pi. So you just extend it so that um, you have a function from r to r, which has the property that uh, f of x plus 2 pi equals f of x for all x. And we'll go back and forth between these two ways of thinking about our function f. All right, so here are the definitions of uh, the, what are called the Fourier coefficients of f. Um, they all have 1 over pi's in front. Actually, the, the, the right way to think of a naught, and we'll um, come back to this, later is to actually think about a naught over 2, which is 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of f of t dt, which is the average value of f on the interval minus pi to pi. Okay, so here are the formulas for the ANs, the BNs, uh, indexed by 
counting numbers, one, two, three, four, dot, 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 and a naught. And then here is what we call the Fourier series for f, which is just that strange looking sum. Now here's the idea of what's going on, and after we do an example, we'll talk about this more carefully. The idea is that if we look at the partial sums, where the little n maybe only goes up to a number capital N, as the capital N goes to infinity, the Fourier series, the truncated Fourier series, is supposed to actually converge in some sense back to the function f. And the reasons this is uh, true combine the linear algebra ideas that we were talking about in the warm-up exercise related to orthogonal projection together with analysis ideas uh, related to the convergence of the Fourier series back to the function f. And um, let's just do an example now to see the magic and then we'll come back to the big picture. So here is uh, what I call the tent function. You'll notice that um, between 0 and pi it's just t. Between uh, minus pi and 0 it's minus t. And each of those are the absolute value of t. So what this is, is we take the absolute value function from minus pi to pi, and then uh, we ex can also think of it as uh, the 2 pi periodic extension. So if you're an engineer, you might call that a triangle wave. Um, after all, the tent is really between 0 and 2 pi, not between minus pi and pi. Okay, so now we're going to compute the Fourier series and look at a picture. And this is just blind computation. Um, I'll make you do it by hand sometimes, but uh, good software can, can do the symbolic computations as well. All right, so this will illustrate, by hand computation, will illustrate a lot of typical things that will happen for our Fourier series. Okay, so let's just uh, work through this step by step. A naught is 1 over pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of absolute value of t dt. Well, absolute value is even, so I can replace that as twice times 1 over pi, the integral from 0 to pi of, and on 0 pi, absolute value of t is just t, d, t. Okay, so uh, this, the reason I can do this is because absolute value of t is even, Remember, and so in other words, the absolute value of minus t equals the absolute value of t. So when I'm computing the integral from minus pi to pi, that's just a twice the integral from 0 to pi. And of course you can prove that analytically using substitution instead of just drawing a picture. All right, so given that, we get 2 over pi, uh, t squared over 2, so I'm 0 to pi, the 2's cancel, uh, the pi squared over pi is just pi, so I get um, pi. And 
remember I said uh, a naught over 2 is the average value. Uh, that'll be pi over 2. And that's clear because uh, the, the function f of t equals t, um, as you go from 0 to pi, uh, ranges linearly from 0 to pi, and the average value will be pi halves. Okay, a n. For n greater than or equal to 1. 1 over pi. Integral from minus pi. Oh, let's do the bn's first. bn. That is 1 over pi. The integral from minus pi to pi of absolute value of t times the sine nt d t. Well, absolute value of t is even. Sine t is odd. And so the product is uh, going to be odd. Because if I, so this is an odd function. Because if I take the absolute value of minus t times sine of minus nt, that will be the absolute value of t times minus sine nt, which is the opposite of the absolute value of sine t um, times sine of nt, the original function. And it's always true that even times odd, we're talking about even function and odd function, is always an odd function. And it's always true that an even function times an even function is even. If you replace t with minus t, in each function, you don't change either function, so you don't change their product. And an odd function times an odd function is always an even function. And that's because replacing t with minus t in each function changes the sign so you get two negatives as compared, uh, and, and they multiply to a plus one when you're comparing the product at minus t to the product at t. Okay, well, anytime you have an odd function and a symmetric interval, the integral over that symmetric interval with respect to the origin is going to be zero because the signed areas cancel out. Or again, you can um, check it analytically just using substitution in definite integrals. So all the sign coefficients are zero. And that'll always happen when you're dealing with uh, an even function and doing the Fourier series. Okay, so the meat of this computation is for the cosine coefficients. And those are 1 over pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of absolute value of t times cosine of nt dt. And since absolute value and cosine are even, their product is even, so it's more convenient to write this as 2 over pi 
times the integral from 0 to pi of t cosine nt. And this guy we shall uh, compute by integrating by parts. Because uh, we want to make the t go away, we will call u the t part, and we will call dv the cosine nt dt part. So then du is dt, and the v we can take is sine nt over n. So a n will be 2 over pi times u v is a t sine n t over n from 0 to pi, then we will subtract off the integral from 0 to pi of v du, which is sine n t over n dt. And the stuff at the endpoints gave us 0, because the uh, at pi, um, sine of n pi is 0, and at 0, both the t and the sine of n t are 0. So a n is 2 over pi. An antiderivative for uh, sine n t is, um, actually for minus sine n t is minus minus uh, cosine n t. So I put the minus inside the integral when I did that is one way to think of it, over n squared. Right, the derivative of cosine nt over n squared is minus sine nt times n over n squared, which is minus sine nt over n. And I evaluate this from 0 to pi. And so I get 2 over pi times 1 over n squared times uh, cos n pi minus cos 0. And cos of n pi goes plus or minus 1 depending on whether n is even or odd, and it's minus 1 to the n. And uh, cos of 0 is 1. Mm -hmm. So what we get is, I can do it piecewise. So if n is even, the cosine n pi and the cos 0 cancel out, so I get 0. And if n is odd, I get in that part of the computation, Minus, minus, minus 1, minus 1, which is minus 2. So altogether, I'll get a minus 4 over pi and a, times 1 over n squared if n is odd. All right, so now let's go back and write down the Fourier series. Okay, so here it is. F, the squiggle means we don't know it's equal yet, <laughs> is a naught over 2, which is pi halves. And then there are no sine terms, but there are cosine terms. And they are minus... Uh, the bn's are 
um, minus 4 pi times one, uh, 1 over n squared. And I'll factor out the minus 4 pi from all of them. And I have a sum over n is odd counting number of 1 over n squared cosine n t. And so that is the Fourier series for the tenth function. Okay, and here is a picture. So at Desmos, I just added up the first six non-zero terms. So I was counting this as the first non-zero term. That was the a naught over 2, which is the average value. And then the next five were the first five cosine terms. Uh, I index the odd numbers as 2j plus 1, starting with j equals 0. And here is this picture of that finite sum of one constant plus five sinusoidal functions. And it's amazing. It looks just like the tenth function with just five terms. Now, in this example, the series actually converges uh, uniformly. Get, so as long as n is large enough, you're uniformly close. You're as close as you want all over the entire interval to the tenth function. And it actually converges uniformly to the tenth function. Uh, the reason it converges uniformly to something is because you notice if you put absolute values inside the summation, the cosines just go between plus or minus 1. And so what you're left with is just the sum over n is odd of 1 over n squared. And that's a, a, a finite sum. So the uh, summation, when you test for absolute convergence, it is absolutely convergence, convergent, and it doesn't matter at what t value you're at. Okay, so let's tie this in to um, how we introduced this lecture, talking about dot products and inner products. So uh, we already talked about how our set of piecewise continuous 2 pi periodic functions uh, are an inner product space with the indicated inner product. Now here's the cool thing. The functions uh, 1 and cosine of nt for all n and sine of mt for all m are orthogonal. In other words, uh, when I take the inner product of 1 with a different one, I always get 0. And so if I look at uh, the finite dimensional subspaces where I only let the omegas go from 1 up to capital N, um, they uh, are um, an orthogonal basis for that finite dimensional subspace. And so the closest thing in that subspace is going to be the projection onto it. And um, we just copied the projection formula from Rn, where the typical terms, remember, were uh, v dot vj over magnitude vj squared and then multiplying by the orthogonal um, basis vectors, vj. And uh, when you work out what all of those inner products are, you get exactly the formula 
the Fourier series uh, formula truncated at capital N. Okay, so um, in fact, the the a naught over two is uh, remember the a naught was one over pi times the integral of f of t, which is the same as the integral of f of t times one, which is the same as the inner product of f with one. And so if you divide uh, that by two, you get the average value, and um, the inner product of one with itself, it's just the integral of uh, one uh, from minus pi to pi, which is uh, one times the length of the interval. Right, so remember, uh, inner product of f with f is the same as the magnitude of f squared in this inner product space. Okay, and if I look at the an Fourier coefficients, the integral part is just the uh, inner product of f with cosine nt, and if you take the inner product of cosine nt with itself, you're just integrating uh, cosine squared nt from minus pi to pi, the average value of cos squared is a half over any uh, period, because, uh, and so is sine squared, its average value a half, because cos squared plus sine squared is one, and the functions are just translations of each other. So that explains the pi in the denominator, and it's analogous for the sine coefficients. Okay, so um, the way to analytically check that all of these functions are orthogonal is you can either use our favorite uh, trig addition angle identities or you can use um, Euler's formula to check them, and I won't do uh, all of these. Let me explain the last two and use them to explain most of the rest. Actually, let's let's start with the the very first one um, as well. So uh, let's look at this one. So it's definitely true that for the complex functions, uh, the integral from minus pi to pi of e to the i n t is uh, an antiderivative is e to the i n t over i n. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, because e to the i n pi is the same as e to the minus i n pi, um, both of those are either 1 or minus 1 depending on whether n is even or odd, uh, that always evaluates to zero. And in real form, that's just the integral from minus pi, sorry, in expanded using Euler's identity, that's really the integral of cosine of nt plus i sine nt, which is plus i times the integral of sine nt. So the complex number zero is the sum of uh, that real number and an imaginary number, so the real part has to be zero and the imaginary part has to be zero. And in terms of our inner products, that's saying that the inner product of one with cos nt is zero, and the inner product of one with sine nt is zero. So all of the trig functions are perpendicular to the constant function one. Okay, now let's go to the last two and check more stuff. All right, so let's look at uh, this one. By uh, 
the rule of exponents for complex exponentials, which we checked using trig identities, this is the same as e to the i n minus m t. So its antiderivative is uh, 1 over i times, um, oh, this should be n minus m. <laughs> But in any case, uh, if we're assuming that m and n are different, those um, are non-zero integers. And so when we evaluate from minus pi to pi, we'll get the same value at either endpoint. Um, uh, and so the difference will be 0. OK. And then we also can do the complete the analogous computation for um, any counting numbers m and n where we look at e to the i n t times e to the i m t. And again, um, we'll always get the same thing at uh, minus pi and pi because uh, the exponential is 2 pi periodic. Okay. So let's just expand these and see that they give us a lot of the orthogonality conditions. So um, if I look at the last two, if the first one of the last two, I'll get the integral from minus pi to pi of cos nt plus i sine nt. That's e to the i n t times cos m t plus um, i sine. Actually, it's cos of. Let me do. Um, both of the last two at once, because all I did was change the plus m to minus m between them. So uh, here I would have, if I was looking at the last one, I would have cosine of plus mt. And if I was looking at the second to last one, it would be cosine of minus mt. So this is cosine of plus or minus mt plus I sine of plus or minus m t dt will always give me 0 when m does not equal n. OK, so how does that expand? That's the integral from minus pi pi of cos mt times cos of plus or minus mt. But cos is even, so that's always cosine of mt. The other real one is i sine nt times i sine plus or minus mt. Sine is odd, so I can pull that plus or minus out of the second sign, and then i squared is minus 1. So I will get minus plus sine nt sine mt. That's the real part. And the imaginary part is, well, there's an i sine nt times a cosine of plus or minus mt. Uh, that is i sine t times cosine of mt. And then the other one is a cosine nt uh, times i sine plus or minus mt, so that is plus or minus 
um, I times uh, cosine nt sine mt dt. And I forgot my n in this sign term. Whew. Okay, so all of that has to be 0 plus 0 i. So the real parts, the real part has to be 0. And the imaginary part has to be zero. But then since I have that minus and plus in the real part, that I can take it with the plus and with the minus and then uh, add them, and I'll get that the product with the cosines uh, has to integrate to zero. So add and subtract. each. And so um, that will imply that the integrals of cosine nt and cosine mt are all zero, and the integrals of sine nt, sine mt, which are the inner products, are also all zero. And when I go over uh, to this one and do the same trick to those, I will get that uh, the integrals of sine nt times uh, cosine mt are all zero, and actually, because m and n are ranging over the natural numbers, that's the same as the one for uh, inner products of cosine mt and sine mt. And that was for, uh, that actually was for n not equal to m. But if I wanted to get a, um, the orthogonality, for example, of sine nt and cosine of nt, I could have gotten it back up from um, uh, these two. And I'll just leave that as an exercise. Okay, so all of these guys are mutually orthogonal. So now let me tell you some facts, and they require uh, mathematical analysis. You probably wouldn't do these in a 3210 or 3220 course, but for example, you might do them in an upper division analysis course or an applied, an applied math course. The first theorem is that if you look at the projections onto these uh, of F onto these two capital N plus one dimensional subspaces spanned by the function one and the cosine nt's and the sine nt's up to capital N, then those projections converge to the original function f in the distance you get from the inner product, where the magnitude, where the distance between f and capital Fn is the magnitude of F minus Fn, which is the square root of the inner product of F minus Fn with itself. So that, they sometimes call that the, the norm squared uh, distance. So that's one kind of convergence. And uh, the other kind has to do with pointwise convergence. So if your function is um, piecewise continuous and is actually uh, piecewise differentiable and with at most uh, jump discontinuities, 
at a finite number of points so that the left hand limit is, uh, and the right hand limit exist, but they're different, then at all the points um, inside the interval where intervals where f is differentiable, the f of uh, fn of t naughts will converge to the f of t naughts. And at all of the jump points, the fn's um, at t naught will converge to the average of the right hand and the left hand limits of f. Okay. So let's look at your homework exercise. You are going to find a Fourier series for the, squ the square wave, which is uh, 1 between 0 and pi, minus 1 between minus pi and 0, and then extended as a 2 pi periodic function. In the text, you will find a Fourier series, but I want you to do it on your own. It's, it's one of the easiest ones that you'll ever have to compute. And at, uh, in the text, they also had pictures of what the approximations look like uh, when you look at the first 3, 6, 12, or 24 non-zero terms. And you can see those trig functions are trying their very, very best to add up to the square wave and they actually are, uh, in, in terms of the distance, they're converging to the square wave in terms of pointwise properties. Um, at every t's which are not a multiple of pi, uh, this, the approximations are converging either to plus one or minus one. And at the jump points, they're converging to the average of the left and the right-hand limits of the original square wave. And in fact, uh, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about differentiating and integrating Fourier series. And if you stare at the square wave, and if you look at the tenth function that we computed Fourier series for, the derivative, so the tenth function is continuous and it's piecewise differentiable. It turns out in that case, you can get the Fourier series for its derivative, for the derivative of the function by just uh, differentiating the original Fourier series term by term. So do you first of all agree that if I take the derivative of the tenth function, I get the square wave? Well, I cannot differentiate the absolute value function um, at the origin, so I can't actually differentiate the tenth function at the corners, so at multiples of pi. But everywhere else, and in particular, let's just look at a minus pi to pi, uh, when t is between 0 and pi, um, tenth is t, so its derivative is 1, and between minus pi and 0, tenth is minus t, so its derivative is minus 1. And you'll, yeah, okay. So uh, what happens when we take the derivatives term by term? Uh, derivative of pi over 2 is 0. So uh, is it true? the Fourier series for the square wave is, <laughs> turn it, uh, 0 minus 4 over pi, the sum over n odd. Derivative of cosine nt is minus n sine nt, so here I would put a plus. n over n squared is 1 over n sine n t. Well, 
you'll find out that it is. And so what's even more amazing about the convergence here is that if you tried showing that this was converging uniformly, you'd be looking at the series of 1 over n, well, actually, half of it roughly, uh, the odd part. And that thing does not converge. It's a divergent series. So somehow these trig functions manage to cancel out in such a beautiful way that actually the truncated Fourier series do converge. Okay, so what's the upshot? Well, uh, the upshot is truncated Fourier series are orthogonal projection of your given function f, which is piecewise continuous on the interval minus pi to pi onto the subspace, say, W capital N, which is the span of 1 cos t all the way up to cos capital N t, sine t, sine 2t, all the way up to sine capital NT, and um, this is an orthogonal basis with respect to our inner product, and uh, these truncated approximations, which I'll call capital FN, actually converge to F in two ways, potentially in two ways. So first, in the, the distance you get from the inner product, and second, there are um, pointwise convergence theorems, and in nice cases, like for the tent function, the convergence is actually uniform. Okay.